Closed captioning for Justice and Law Weekly is provided in part by the Clifford Law Offices in support of quality public television for the Chicago area. What's the primary mission of the Chicago public school system? When you look at what parents want, I mean, they want a great school in their neighborhood. Uh, so our premise is very simple. We want to create a system of great schools, not necessarily a great school system, but a system of great schools. Everybody wants great schools. So the question, the big question for us then is how do you make sure every school is good and what goes into the ingredients or the, the, the part to creating great schools? And all of that will identify the work you've got to do to make sure you have a system of great schools. And, and w w how do you interact with the, uh, the uh, leaders in the individual schools to achieve that goal? I think you've hit the nail on the head. It, it is about the leadership of the school. It is about the principalship. Good schools or good principals uh, and, and the schools tend to have sort of a mutualistic kind of relationship. Schools take on the personality of great leaders. So if you start with a great principal, uh, if, you, if we put that as the premise, as, as the foundation for a good school, good principals understand that their primary job is teacher selection, teacher retention, sometimes yes, teacher exiting, but really it is about making sure you've got great teachers in the classroom because they'll take care of the kids. So a principal's job is to make sure there's coherence and making sure that they're doing a phenomenal job of focusing on that particular part of the job. Who helps address these budget problems? I, I boy, what a nightmare that is. Huh? Tell <coughs> we us do. about the budget problems. Well, the budget problems are, are we had a deficit and uh, approximately $600 million deficit and about a total $6 billion a budget, um, and uh, including capital, and, and so those uh, those are real, real challenges to face, and we have to help the staff. They, they come up with the proposals, and we comment on that, which is typically how it works between the board and, and senior staff and management. And so you know, there's a lot of discussions that go into and a lot of listening. You know, there were budget hearings across the city. Uh, some of the board members attended those and heard that feedback from citizens and, and brought that back to the boardroom and, and told management about what we heard and gave our insights and what, where we can cut, where we think it's wise to cut, and where we need to find additional revenues, which we did also do. Difficult decisions to ask taxpayers for more money in very challenging times, but for the benefit of the schools and our, and our kids, we thought it was very, very important to do. I'm Bob Clifford, President of the Chicago Bar Association, and welcome to a special edition of the Chicago Bar Association's Justice in Law Weekly. During this program, we are continuing our conversation about Chicago Public Schools with CPS Chief Executive Officer Jean-Claude Grizard and CPS School Board Vice President Jesse Ruiz. Prior to this, his appointment in Chicago, Mr. Grizard served as superintendent of the Rochester, New York school system. He is also a former physics teacher and high school principal. Mr. Ruiz is the partner with the law firm of Drinker, Biddle and Reith, where he concentrates his practice in mergers, acquisitions, and public service. Prior to joining the Chicago Public School Board, he served as chairman of the Illinois State Board of Education. He is active in the Hispanic community and also serves on the U.S. Department Education Equity and Excellence Commission. Welcome, gentlemen. Good Thank to you, see Bob. you again. Good there to see we you. go. You're a busy guy. I try My to be. Goodness. I try to be. Tell, never bored. <laughs> tell us about the, uh, the what you're doing on a national level. Well, the. Uh, Arnie Duncan formed the Equity and Excellence Commission to talk about something we talked about last week was just equitable funding of education and this is now a nationwide view that not only among school districts in Illinois do we have inequity but we have inequity from state to state and so trying to not only have a more equitable system but also focusing and notice the name excellence in that that we are hoping that also drives excellence and not forgetting how do we have uniform excellence across the nation so it's a panel of about 30 of us and I'm, I'm glad just to be in the room because it's national education experts uh, and like Linda Darling Hammond and Eric Hanischek and these renowned scholars who uh, have come together and uh, we meet in Washington and we're continuing to meet we've got our next meeting in December we'll have a report out uh, probably by mid next year on recommendations that we hope will 
not only drive some policy, but also foster a national conversation about these issues that we need to have greater excellence across our uniform excellence across our school systems, across all states, and greater equi equity to go along with that. Right. Superintendent, uh, do you uh, have a view about whether the things that uh, uh, Jesse just described could be helpful to you in your work for CPS? Oh, absolutely. Could, could you explain that? Because I'm especially interested in the equitable thing about the money. That, there's yes. something wrong going on here. Sure. Right? You know, it's interesting because that was one of the last things I worked on prior to leaving Rochester, looking at equity in funding within a district. Um, so there was a, a massive lawsuit before that in New York State looking at equity across the entire state. But we also believed that there was inequitable distribution of resources within school districts. So what you'll find in many places um, is that you'll find the best teachers tend to be in some parts of the city, in the newest, perhaps in most inexperienced teachers in different parts of the city. When you look at funding across schools, very seldom do you find systems. Again, that may not be for Chicago, but certainly across the country, you'll find that dollars tend to be driven to the people who are most noisy, who know how to access and pull. Squeaky wheels get yeah, greased. Absolutely. So it's, it's, it's an issue that a group called ERS, Education Resources Strategies, often look at and talk about. So in Rochester, we looked at chunking monies based on a number of different factors, including special education, poverty, et cetera. All of that was part of our equitable student funding system to begin to rebalance the system and drive dollars where it's needed most. Right. In our earlier segment, uh, you had mentioned uh, where the funds come to s uh, fund uh, the CPS. and. I think the people hear about that, but I don't know that they fully appreciate the uh, what's really going on with uh, education being uh, funds being based on uh, property taxes. And yes. could you explain that a little bit better for us? Well, absolutely. So we get our funding from three different places. Of course, the city of Chicago, the city of Illinois, and the federal government. The feds tend to fund either grants for different projects or they have title monies, title one for poverty, title two for professional development in all technology, et cetera. So the, the, the feds fund a portion, but the bulk of our dollars here come from the city um, of, of Chicago. And when you look at the way the state pushes the dollars, it's pushed based on local or, or state property taxes. So if you happen to live in, in a neighborhood or in a part of the state that has high property taxes, your schools, your per pupil allocation tends to be a bit higher. Right. Um, where if you are in, in a city with a larger, perhaps, percentage of pro poverty, you're going to get lower property uh, taxes. So you, you, you build an inequitable or inequity in the system from, from the get-go. Right, and it perpetuates creates, itself. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. So and what is the view, of, in maybe in your circles, about how to correct that? You know, well, I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm, I'll right. leave it to the experts. I know right now the Urban League is actually looking at this um, with some support from Jenner and Block, looking at how they go actually looking to address One this. One of our other cities, other great law firms. Sure. Exactly. Via a lawsuit, right. they, they're suing yes. the Illinois State yes. Board of Education about this very issue. And they so are. they're working on potentially finding a settlement uh, by reformulating the funding formula that could be more equitable without a lot of additional resources because the state simply doesn't have money. it. So exactly. if they win, how, what, what does that mean for me, the fellow who pays taxes, who's willing to pay taxes, but also wants it to be equitably spent? Sure. Uh, you ch taxes may not likely change, but the amount of dollars coming into a district like Chicago could change. Mm -hmm. And, and reapportion those dollars where we see there is more acute need based on students living in poverty, students living uh, with a greater number of students in special education or English language learners, those things that we realize take a bit more resources to do. Uh, and again, as Jean-Claude had stated uh, in, in an earlier program, it's not all about the money, but there's some thresholds that you have to exceed and, and that we understand just require certain to us to acquire certain resources that students need. Right. And, and you were talking earlier about the achievement gap. I, I have to believe that the disparity in funding just promotes the continuation of that achievement gap. Yeah. It's, 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 I would say, inequity in resource allocation. Right. So dollars is one piece. The distribution of quality teachers and leaders is another. Uh, people ask me, why do you have such a huge uh, gap when you look at African Americans and white students in Chicago? In the high schools, there's a 44% achievement gap between the two groups. For Latinos, it's 30% between whites and Latino students. And my response is very simple, access to quality. Um, and, and we've got to find a way to create a Whitney Young or Walter Payton on the south and west sides of the city to making sure that kids have access to quality all, all across the board. So it's distribution of dollars, distribution of, of the best people, the best adults, 
and, and everything else that we know uh, exists to create great schools across the city. Um, how, how do we motivate uh, teachers, the best of teachers, to uh, do that very thing, to go into yeah. those schools? I know that's on your mind. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. It's a big question because for me it goes back to even how we pay teachers. Mm -hmm. We have a system that is completely outdated and, and, and there's been a tremendous amount of research to show that today's teacher, today's generation of teachers don't care for this model of getting paid based on how long you've been there and how many college credits you have. So we have a system that's completely bureaucratic that does not look at performance, that does not look at career ladder, that does not look at the, the, the contribution of a teacher to a classroom. So if a teacher teaches to, to teach in a very hard to staff subject, or perhaps in a turnaround school, or chooses to be a teacher leader, they should be paid differently based on that. The same way you do in private, <coughs> private industry. A whole differentiated pay system is one that we have to push through with certain flaws along the way to make sure that no one's making, say, 20000 for 50 years, but to make sure that there are steps along the way, but within those bands to allow for differentiation based on performance, et cetera. And how do you do that with the unions being such an obstacle? You know, I, I think if, 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 because I brought this up to, to Karen Lewis, the head of the union, right. back in, in May, she was very receptive to the conversation. Uh, whenever we sit and talk about this, this process, with the leadership of, of, of any teachers union, they tend to want to listen to hear more because what it does is it gives agency, it gives teachers agency in, in their profession. Um, the current system came at a time when there was a need to protect people back in you know the 50s and 60s where we're taking a lot of... You know, my dad was a carpenter. If it wasn't for the unions... Yeah, absolutely. I, but at times I, I have to tell you I can't help but believe the unions, the pendulum has swung too far and the unions have gone too far yes. and, and, and there's got to be some rebalancing. We, we overcorrected. I think a problem that was really fundamental and that was real. Uh, when you look at past leadership uh, back in the 60s with Albert Schenker, et cetera. So we've overcorrected. We've got to go back and swing the pendulum back to the center and protect teachers at the same time give them agency in the profession by treating them like professionals. Right now we don't do that. Is tenure um, an issue uh, within the CPS? Uh, do teachers achieve tenure in CPS? Oh, absolutely. And, like and, and I don't think it's an issue uh, given the new law with Senate Bill 7 which attaches performance now to tenure which is a wonderful thing. Um, but if principals do their job really well in evaluating teachers and if we give them the tool to do it well Tenure takes care of itself. So tenure reform, I think, is, is already well underway in Illinois, in fact, leading the nation in this conversation. What we have here in this state is the envy of the rest of the country. But we've got to make sure principals do their job well in, 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 in protecting people who deserve it and exiting those who, who don't deserve it. And speaking of performance-based, uh, that little fellow, the mayor, uh, he's kind of yes. put a performance-based mandate on you, I think. <laughs> oh, I, we, we welcome it. Yeah. I, think, I think it's a wonderful thing. Top to bottom uh, performance management. Uh, we all should be paid based on how well we do the job. And right. if we can't do it, we shouldn't have it. And, and what, uh, I, I know that he, uh, he empowers the people in his leadership team and he yes. has empowered you, yes. but, but how, do, uh, how does he measure your performance? Uh, is there a process that you well, have I, to go through? I believe there are about 11 pages of performance in my okay. contract. <laughs> um, and that's become Did he negotiate your contract for you <laughs> or on the <laughs> other <laughs> side of you? I did <laughs> review it. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, he reviewed it. Um, but you know, that's become in many ways the baseline by which we're measuring a lot of other things. So when we build that contract, we were looking at principals, we were looking at teachers, we were looking at everybody because the contract focused on the bottom line, kids and their performance. How well are we doing by our students? So today, in fact, track East schools are getting a progress, school progress report uh, that parents are going to get, which is easy to read, which for the first time puts in the hands of parents. Was, this was a promise made by the mayor that has come to fruition. Uh, in a very simple way to parents, an easy way, not insulting people's intelligence, but a way for parents to really gauge the performance of the school so they can make an informed decision. And, and um, well, let me talk about that. Number one, I think that's been widely discussed in the media that uh, some parents are really going to be shocked and disappointed by yes. Those, yes. Uh, those reports. Yes. But when you say make an informed decision, I mean, you know, where are they going to go? I mean, uh, you know, if a parent gets a report about the school that they're in, how are they going to be empowered to make a change or to react or respond? I mean, what do you mean by that? So a couple of things. So when you take a look at choice within Chicago, right. we, a lot of our parents vote with their feet. So if you follow the people in the city, you can find quality. Um, so we have 
pockets of overcrowded schools because our parents are making their way there. We have underperforming schools because parents are leaving and voting with their feet. That's one big piece around the choice. The second, if you put the, the, the data, the information in the hand of parents, they're going to push the leadership, including myself, to do what's right by schools. They're going to say, how come only 20% of the kids in the school are meeting proficiency? I want this changed. So we are hoping for that kind of pressure, that kind of accountability all across the board to making sure that teachers, principals, and the CEO are doing the job they have to do to make sure kids are learning. See, but I, I, I hear you, but I, I have to tell you, just to be, again, a little bit as a devil's advocate here, okay, maybe I, I go, I move with my feet because I'll move to the better places and that's where you have some overcrowding, mm -hmm. but for a whole lot of people, they, yes. their feet don't move and they don't have the ability to move. Yeah. Uh, they're stuck with what they have. and. Yeah. Uh, is there an initiative to say to the, the, a, a school that's underperforming, hey, we're not going to shut you down because mm -hmm. uh, we need you. There's, your your, your uh, enrollment is up to speed of where it could be, but you've got to do better, and we're watching you. Why yeah. can't you put those teachers and principal on a watch list? So the answer is we're doing all of the above. And okay. yes, we may need to shut some down. Right. When you have a school that's been failing for 15 years in a row, enough already. That's, that's terrible. Exactly. But, 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 but what if you can't shut it down from the perspective of the need because okay. that's where the people are at and they don't have a choice to go somewhere else? So turn around. So we have some amazing operators who will we take a turn around specialists. Oh, absolutely. We have an amazing one here called the Academy for Urban School Leadership is mm -hmm. one, one possibility, charter schools. Right. And our, our own internal turnaround outfit uh, led by a guy named Don Friend is terrific. He's done amazing work at Finger and He's other the schools. Enforcer. He's in he's internal. So <laughs> CPS turn around AUSL charter schools. We've got to bring quality to these places. But don't I wouldn't underestimate the power of a demand parent. One who understands that they don't seize the information who goes back and demands that things be changed and be made made to be different. The power of the collective of parents and students demanding change uh, at a school very often we'll turn schools around. We have tons of examples right here in the city. And across yeah. the state. We do yes. this at the, there's new powers that give the Illinois State Board of Education the power to do this. And last year they took over the, or earlier this year, they took over East St. Louis School District. They literally were able to remove yes. the superintendent right. and, and, and in essence uh, supersede the powers of the school board when a, a district is just chronically failing. Yeah. We need you to do things like that. You're a oh, tough guy, I could tell. Yeah. Huh? This I is tell all people, good. don't, 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 uh, um, 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 Misunderstand the smile. Yeah, I was going to say, I don't want this big <laughs> smile. And, uh, I, mean, I'm, I'm, I smile yeah. a lot, but I can get very huh? serious. Uh, this is yes. very good. Uh, you know, and uh, I think that uh, one of the things that uh, we're all so hopeful for is that you'll find ways to partner with members of the community. We talked about this a little bit earlier, but uh, it strikes me that there are people in the community, if you could develop programs mm -hmm. for, let's say, a second uh, a period of service for whether it's retiring lawyers or uh, other business leaders mm -hmm. that if you could identify needs that that can be filled whether it's a mentoring program mm -hmm. uh, and, and you put the call to action out there yes. I, I, I don't know if you have plans like that but I yes. think that there's a willingness to, uh, out there it, when, during a, one of our breaks, people came up to you out of the blue, you didn't know, and they, and they said they're so hopeful for you. And I think yes. that's the sense of this community. We are so hopeful for you. Yeah. So we'll help give you the tools, you Thank know? You. Thank you. Uh, but education mean, is you the have future. things like that? It's the well, future. It's the future of our city. Without, without that, we're never going to be successful. It's the future of our country. Look, oh, I mean, what he's, Very you much know. So. Absolutely. But you know, I think one, one way we can begin that work, and we plan on doing that, is maybe reinventing the whole principal for a day program to really begin to create partnerships between not-for-profit and for-profit organizations with schools and allow it to grow organically. The work will begin in earnest this November and it will launch next year. When you grow a partnership, what is a mutualistic sort of a set of expectations, one that grows organically, uh, that will sustain over time is what we're looking to build where you can bring the mentoring for, for kids, you can bring the relevancy around curricula. So imagine for instance a, a bunch of chefs working at a school that has a program for food services. Right. The relevancy for the kids, the real world experience becomes natural and organic, it goes beyond leadership, it becomes part of two organizations who are working together. So all of that are part of our build to relaunch for next year. Right. 
Um, on a related but different subject, uh, what's happening with the, the libraries within the schools? Are, are they going to be and are they, are they still relevant? Are they going mm -hmm. to be relevant, yeah. the libraries? Absolutely. You know, many schools have classroom libraries, which right. are phenomenal. Um, but I'm one who also believes in having a library only because I love the space. I love watching it and right. seeing it whenever I visit a school. I often ask, can I go see your library? Um, so we do have um, um, a new education team, and, and they've, um, um, they're have they looking at, at ways of retooling the library services within, within, this, within the district and how to better partner uh, with Mary Dempsey and the folks at the... At the, the library commissioner. Absolutely. Right. Um, ways of making that much more organic. And, and of course, the, the public library system in Chicago is pretty robust and has been a tremendous partner for us. So all of that is part of our discussions right now in the education team. Is there an overlap that if, you know, you, you have a $700 million budget deficit? Mm -hmm. Is there an overlap between uh, what the, uh, the Chicago public library system is doing and what... Uh, uh, the schools are doing that maybe you can have some economies there? There might be, um, and that's part of our discussion as well, uh, where perhaps we don't have the space for a library uh, within a particular school. The question is, what's the, what's, what's the geography look like? What's closest to the school? How can we leverage a local library system um, or a branch to actually support a particular elementary or high school? So all of that has been and will be part of our discussion moving okay. forward. You know, one of the uh, big concerns going uh, uh, through uh, the discussion, dialogue in the legal community is the uh, absence or uh, diminished uh, engagement with the students in the area of civics. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're very, very concerned about that. Mm -hmm. Is uh, CPS, is that something you care about? Or, uh, oh, yes. In fact, you know, the group, there's a group called the Mikva Challenge. Mikva Challenge. Yes. So, Abner Mikva. I yes. spoke to him last week. Amazing. He's so, coming here. Okay. He's I'd, agreed I'd, to come I'd, here. I'd love to meet him. Would you? Because I'll make I've, it I've been meeting with his uh, with the students uh, monthly. They're a terrific group of Wonderful. kids. Wonderful. And they've brought the same. Have topic you met up. his his friend Newton Minow? Um, no. Who is no. Uh, your wife's, wife's law, law partner? partner. Yes. Uh, so, he's. Yeah. We are so blessed in this community yes. to have those old guys yes. and now young guys <laughs> like you. <laughs> I'm not sure about so young. Um, <laughs> But we, we, they, they brought the same conversation up around the requirements for high school. How can we look at that? Uh, and amongst other things, and bringing uh, all of that kind of learning back into our high schools. So we do have a high school team looking at how ways of transforming the high school experience, making it much more relevant to today's needs and what kids will need after high school. And that is one part of our dialogue, one part of our conversation. Right. I, I know how important it is uh, w in the view that uh, to make our students college ready, mm -hmm. and yet isn't it also true that uh, we need uh, the worker? We need workers. Yes. We need, you yes. know, I'm I'm blessed to go to work every day in a coat and tie, and as are you and, mm -hmm. and Jesse, and, mm -hmm. and yet uh, we need those folks who yes. are. Uh, not maybe not our father's mechanics, but uh, yes. the new mm -hmm. ones. Uh, absolutely. Is there a, at all a technical development program that uh, you're trying to institute? Oh, absolutely. And Can you tell us about that. Career tech is a big part of my my my, my core fabric, uh, because I was part of the transformation work in New York for a long time, and I was a principal of one of those schools. Um, so I, again, going back to the mechanic piece about. Uh, to this other technician is that your grandfather's mechanic. We've got to make sure kids understand algebra, understand how to read and write and add and be informed citizens. Um, and if they change their mind at the end of high school, they want to go to college. And they're prepared for that. So that's yeah. fundamental. But when you take a look at the work we have to do on career, career tech ed, uh, making sure that we have every program ending in some kind of credential industry relevant or industry uh, uh, supported credential, kids can come out of high school and get a job and in, in, in a meaningful career. Um, we have had a CTE or career tech education department that has done an amazing job here in rebuilding and are still rebuilding, now actually leading the dialogue in most major cities across the country. In fact, Harvard just published a document on the Chicago work that we are doing. So everything from culinary arts to automotive technology um, to information technology uh, to hospitality and tourism, all of that now are parts of the portfolios that we're building. But again, the, the coursework scaffolds to a credential 
where a child can come out of the program and say, look, I have an industry recognized credential and I right. want to go to work. Mm -hmm. Or if they choose to, to go to the city colleges or someplace else and continue their education. We often call that multiple exit points, mm -hmm. multiple entry points. So we're building a lot of that. And lastly, uh, I'll be talking to, to the chancellor of the city colleges. Uh, we're Cheryl taking, Hyman. Cheryl Hyman. We're thinking about building a school together that may be a 9 right. to 16 continuum, or 9 to 14, I'm sorry, 9 right. to 14 continuum. Kids come in ninth grade and they finish with an associate degree, perhaps around the healthcare industry is one we're looking at. Um, so lots of activity right now mm -hmm. around developing that part of the portfolio of work for us. Yeah, I think uh, Chicago City Colleges has 114,000 uh, enrollees. I mean, it's an mostly, amazing number. Mostly CPS kids. And mostly CPS kids. Yes. Is, that's, that's pretty amazing. Yes. Um, uh, let me go back, if I may, if may, to the new commission that uh, Jesse's on. Um, the, the, you're coming out with a report at mm -hmm. the end of the year, you're hoping. Next year. Mid next year. Next year. How, how is that going to uh, change his life or let him uh, the, the, achieve his goals? How, how are we going to make that happen? Or is it just going to be another one of these doggone reports out well, of Washington? Well, yeah, and that's the debate we've been having because those of us who are spending a fair amount of our time and our life on this, we don't want it to be another white paper that just sits on a shelf. Right. And so uh, hopefully it'll have workable policy ideas that can turn into legislation, that can, can become reality in states across our nation. And, and uh, I think informing and, and uh, encouraging the debate is a critical function as well that we're we're going to do and arm folks with information and statistics that'll give them the arguments they need to say local policy uh, makers you know this is the change we need right right that's I mean, that's, that's terrific uh, we, we sure hope that works um, you know in our earlier program we talked about the uh, expansion of the school day and uh, uh, I, I don't want to cover all that ground again but I think the one thing I, I left out was where do you see that going? We're, we're, you know, we've had this debate. Now we got the labor relations board. We know you're meeting with the mm -hmm. teachers union, and mm -hmm. and yet the mayor is determined, and I think most of Chicago agrees with him about the importance yes. of doing this. Yes. Where's where's that going to end up? Where we're we going to be with this? Well, we're going to implement this system wide next fall, uh, beginning with tracky schools in, next August. Elementary schools most likely will see 90 minutes. Last night we met with the advisory council to get their ideas and suggestions and concerns around what's been happening with the elementary and their ideas for the high schools. We're not sure if the high schools will have 90 minutes. They already have a six hour and 54 minute day. So we need to only add maybe 30 or 40 minutes for the high school day. And that was our discussion last night. So we're right. not sure yet. So once we have a package, we, we've begun to talk to the union about how we're going to implement this. And I would still love to see the head of the union be part of our advisory council. The door is still open for her to come in. Um, but the advisory council is meeting to, to guide the work. We have a great project manager. But next August, all schools in the city, especially the elementary schools, will see a longer school day. Um, and what will go into that is the discussion that we're having right now. Uh, we do want to see some consistency across the system. At the same time, we want to allow schools to grow this organically. So, so far with the 13 schools, we've seen everything from all math and, and literacy to all enrichment mm -hmm. around the arts and music in mm -hmm. some schools. Um, and the one thing we want to make sure happens is that we don't just see the core academics in the poor schools, but we also see the enrichment in the poor schools as well as the more affluent schools. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a delicate balancing act that we are pushing, but we, we know that the 90 minutes will take us back to national average when it comes to the length of the school day and the school year. Right. What's unfortunate is that many cities now across the country are pushing for even a longer school day. So we actually right. may get to parity next fall, but we find ourselves back. <laughs> That's okay. Then you the bar's can do it again. Being raised. You know? Yes. Bar's mean, uh, raised. Beware of what you wish for. You know. Well, you know, we know we all need it. We all yeah. need it. One, yes. one last thing, if I may. Uh, how, if you know, this program, uh, we're very blessed with great viewers and, and a stable source of viewers who are very engaged in our community and they want to be helpful to you. Yes. Uh, when this program is replayed, it'll go to millions of people. What message would you like to send to them about how we can help you? What, what would you like the community do to rally around your efforts so that you achieve the goals that you have for these children? The one thing I ask people is, is that I need leverage and talent. But for the, for the masses, I tell people I need crew, not passengers. I need people to get involved in any way possible, joining an LSC, joining a PTA, writing a letter to the editor, uh, pushing 
by any means necessary, get involved in a dialogue and conversation. If you have the time, volunteer at a school. If you're the CEO of an organization, partner with a school and, and, right. and, and, and help that principal with the myriad of issues that he or she is actually facing. So please don't stand by and watch and cheer from the sidelines, get in the race, become part of our conversation, get involved in our schools, we need you. Well, hopefully uh, that message will resonate with some of our viewers and you'll get some more, some more of that as well. Yes. Gentlemen, thank you both very thank much. You, Bob. Thank you, Thank you. Uh, Mr. Rizard, Mr. Ruiz, we certainly uh, hope that you are able to accomplish the goals that you have set for improving the Chicago public school system. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us on this special segment of Justice and Law Weekly. I'm Bob Clifford. Thank you so much for watching. Closed captioning for Justice and Law Weekly is provided in part by the Clifford Law Offices in support of quality public television for the Chicago area.